Sounds like a natural hush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. I'm Pat Lockray, Warden of Goldsmiths and Smile. Huge pleasure to welcome you all here this evening with team guests. And a very warm welcome to all of those watching us on live stream. A great new dimension of these events. I have a great honour tonight of introducing Lauren to the stage. It's a big task in front of her friends and her associates, her colleagues, her family. So I hope there's a degree of anxiety because it adds to it. Uh, an inaugural lecture is a night to celebrate, to celebrate the award of a professorship, to reflect an academic journey and to share with others how that journey happened and what the future might hold. A big moment in the life academic. And particularly big for someone like me who's not himself a professor, because I have great pleasure in witnessing the professorial journey from afar, and even the greater pleasure of being part of its fruition. Those phone calls communicating the outcome of the appointments process are pure joy, really special moments. And these inaugural lectures are, without exception, really significant milestones. The title is itself a true celebration of distinguished academic achievement. And it surely doesn't come without sacrifice, dedication, and a high degree of talent. It's my job tonight to highlight how Lauren came to become the academic that she is today, and how she achieved that richly deserved title that we're celebrating here. Lauren grew up in Essex and left school having acquired A-levels in English, Music, Biology and Chemistry. With that eclectic and, and unorthodox mix, was it any wonder that she ended up at Goldsmiths really? She was part of a talented cohort of students, 20 of whom were accepted into Cambridge or Oxford. Lauren was part of the latter and began a Physiological Science BA in 1994 under the guidance of her tutor, Dr. Piers Nye, who I believe is here this evening. Piers, you're particularly welcome. Those early mentoring days bear fruit. Lauren told me that Oxford was a particularly good fit for her. She found peers, worked in the student union, and like many, many others, found a life companion in Simon. Love in the laundry. <laughs> so by physiology, Lauren told me that of her interest at school, human biology was strongest, but she was certain that she didn't want to become a medical doctor. In the final years, as her final years as an undergraduate, she was able to take a couple of modules in psychology and was captivated from the outset. Psychology gave Lauren an opportunity to study the brain from a case study perspective. It's not hard to imagine a young physiology student becoming swept away by the mystique and the majesty of the human brain. So she remained at Oxford, taking an MSc in neuroscience, during which time she took particular interest in magnetic stimulation, alongside trying to understand the mechanisms underlying schizophrenia. This transition to psychology, specifically to neuroscience, eventually led her away from Oxford. She got a job as a research assistant to the great Professor Uta Frith at the Institute for Cognitive Neuroscience at UCL. And it was this platform that gave her the opportunity to embark on her PhD and her first foray into the neuroscience of music. Frith and her Oxford tutor, Vincent Walsh, co-supervised Laura's PhD, which sought to investigate how the brain changes as it acquires literacy. Of course, a project such as this would require subjects who were illiterate. Thankfully, something pretty darn rare today. It's a happy fight, but it was quite a serious stumbling block for the research, but one which Lauren was suitably placed to overcome. A talented clarinetist, music literacy presented itself as a renewed focus of her PhD. And I know Lauren will tell you much more and with much better passion than I can about that epiphany 
in itself later on this evening. The timing of her PhD could not have been better as it coincided with the wider emergence of a new field, the cognitive neuroscience of music. After a stint at the University of Newcastle as welcome postdoctoral uh, research fellow, in 2006, Lauren found herself at Goldsmiths after she was selected as an RCUK fellowship. It may come as a shock to some, but Lauren told me Goldsmiths is very different from our previous institutions, UCL and Oxford, and we value our difference. Lauren expressed how the community of Goldsmiths, its size and its feel is hugely conducive to collaboration, and made particular mention of the career-long support she received from Elizabeth Hill, from Jane Paul, and from Alan Pickering, to name just a few. Lauren has so far left a distinctive and resonant footprint here at Goldsmiths. The MSc Music, Mind and Brain program is one of which, for which I have enormous personal admiration, and one which exemplifies the innovative spirit of which Goldsmiths is so proud. The course is now, would you believe, 10 years old, and in that time has seen 225 students graduate. There have, of, from that number, there have been 37 dissertations published in academic journals. That's a considerable achievement for a master's program, by the way. And finally, 40 students have continued to to PhD level, both at Goldsmiths and abroad. That's 40 students. 13 of these graduates have attained their doctorates and secured postdoctoral positions, starting and building their own research teams. One of the least celebrated but most significant parts of university life is to secure the future of the academy, to nurture and maintain, as you did, all that time ago, Dr. Nye, to secure the stars of the future. Boy, Lauren, have you done that in spades with that remarkable program. It's so, so important. These figures are truly impressive, and I very much hope that the course can continue to build on its initial success. Although Lauren founded and inspired the program, a few notable colleagues are always on her tongue when she discusses it, or she's always keen to recognize the work of Dr. Daniel Monsifan and uh, a key role in building the program over the years, and now more recently, the work of Dr. Maria Haruja Rias and Dr. Diana Omege, who are vital to the future of the program, which we are sure will flourish as it's done in the past. At the moment, Lauren is perpetually on the move as she juggles her work at Goldsmiths, her two young children, and her position as co-director of the Music and the Brain Research Centre in Denmark. I think most of us would struggle to keep our heads above water with such a burden, but Lauren continues to look for new opportunities and research avenues. She recently won a prestigious MRC, AHRC Global Health Grant to explore the potential of music making for mental health in developing countries. The project is based, where else, but Gambia, and she will be heading there as soon as March. I know I speak for all of us, Lauren, and I wish you so very well, such good luck with that important project and all the other projects which you inspire and which you make happen. Uh, we are so keen to hear tonight a bit about it, I'm sure, but also to hear more about it as it unfolds and as it develops. Because, Lauren, you are a star at Goldsmiths, you really are, and this recognition is one for which you are richly deserving. We are truly proud to have you in our number. I welcome you so warmly to the stage, Professor Lauren Stewart. lovely that I just see so many of my friends and family in the audience already. I've just been catching up with a lot of them, so that sort of puts me at ease a little bit. Um, are, are my levels okay for a start? Good. Okay. 
Well, you can't see anything. There we go. All right. So I'd like to say it's a great privilege to be a professor here at Goldsmiths, and I really do mean it when I say that Goldsmiths has felt like an incredibly good fit for me personally. But um, as Pat already alluded to, this wouldn't have happened without so many people. And before I get started properly, I want to make sure that I acknowledge the people who have been so instrumental in my research career so far. Um, so I really hope that I haven't missed anybody out. I'm, I'm sure I have. Um, but in particular, I had incredible support from the tutors from beyond my, pre, my pre-Goldsmiths days who provided so much inspiration and guidance in setting me off on this track. Um, and um, Piers and I and Uta Frith are here this evening. I'm incredibly grateful um, to have their mentorship um, and wisdom, and um, Vincent Walsh and John Morton as well, who, who are not here. Um, in terms of the Goldsmiths journey, um, I, I had incredible support from my former heads of department, Jane Powell and Alan Pickering, and also the former warden, Geoffrey Crossick, uh, who really got behind the, the new master's programme in Music, Mind and Brain, and made that happen. And I think that the master's programme was the kernel around a lot of um, activity. My, my research group formed, the students did great projects, we've been publishing a lot of their work, and it really all did coalesce, um, especially when Daniel Willens even came on board as co-director, and we really expanded the program. Pam Heaton, I said, um, I'd like to point out, was really instrumental in me setting my sights on Goldsmiths and realising the potential um, that existed here and, and what an incredible fit it was. Um, and Elizabeth Hill and Andy Bremner have provided great support to me over the years as well. Um, the people in that first column are really the drivers behind a lot of the work um, uh, that I'm talking about today, the people that have really carried out the work. Um, but I've listed, I hope, um, all of my collaborators and students um, that I'm so pleased um, to be working with. Um, so the other thing to say is that, of course, we got a little bit of money from some nice people as well. And that made all the difference. Um, so. Um, it's going to be a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, I've kind of tailored it to the fact that um, friends and family are here. They may not have an undergraduate degree in psychology, um, for instance. Um, so some of it may be a little bit <laughs> superficial, um, but I wanted to cover um, some of the kind of major projects that I've done since being at Goldsmiths. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit about what I've learned about music and the brain what we have discovered um, here in my research group um, and what we would still like to know going forward. So, the first thing I'd like to impress upon you is the fact that processing music in the mind and the brain is a conscious and active process of construction. Music, of course, doesn't exist in the world. We have to create it. In physical terms, music is just a collection of air molecules vibrating at the eardrum. But our experience of this is so much more. And this is a, a, a nice photograph of Imogen Heap, who Casper Adelman and I collaborated with last year on um, the project called the, the Sound of Happy, uh, which was all about making babies giggle and composing new music. So that was a great privilege. So it's, it's an incredible feat of construction. The other thing to say is that in our culture, um, there's an idea that music is performed by the few for the many. Okay? But this is a highly cultural manifestation, because in many parts of the world, music is highly participatory. And there isn't really a distinction between listeners and performers. Everyone is involved as both. And making music is as natural as eating or breathing. This is a picture of the vendor people from South Africa, um, which, who, who present a very good example of this. So actually, I would in, in fact argue that we are all musicians, regardless of our ability to play a musical instrument. And that's because as listeners, we, de we demonstrate some remarkably sophisticated <coughs> perceptual abilities. So let's think about that for a moment. We take a physical stimulus, vibrating air molecules uh, at the eardrum, and we um, convert different parts of this stimulus 
to pitch, to interval, to contour, duration, rhythm, meter. This is already a big feat of processing. But so far, I'm only referring to something that is happening at any instantaneous point in time. Really, by definition, music is something that unfolds over time. So what we're actually doing when we're listening to music is taking incoming physical stimulus, converting it to these properties, integrating it with what's come before, and predicting what will come next. So it's an incredible feat of brain processing. Even though most people deny being musicians unless they have the ability to play a musical instrument, which I think is the wrong way around. I think playing a musical instrument is the icing on the cake, really. Um, but we're all remarkably musically sophisticated. But where do these abilities come from? Are we born with them? Well, not quite, but we are born with the machinery to quickly learn about the musical rules of the culture into which we are born. So one of my favourite experiments was conducted by some um, Canadian researchers, Hannon and Treehub, and they were very interested to know whether North American adults and later on North American infants of six months of age could detect an irregularity in tunes that were either in a simple meter or a complex meter. Let me play you an example. So first the simple meter, which would be familiar to Canadian listeners. So this is uh, music that's arranged in sort of 3-4 um, four or 4-4, four, four, something that's very common to us. example, the second example that I played you, um, the irregularity that's introduced disrupts the, the metrical structure. Um, and this is in a simple meter, now in a complex meter. Meter. So the idea with a complex meter, um, you might have time signatures of um, uh, five, five, seven, eight, for instance. So things that are are grouped um, in in odd numbers. Okay, and you can already hear that that's quite unfamiliar to our ears. So the question was, could the North American adults and later the infants spot the, the irregularity in the simple meter first of all, and in the complex meter? Now here's the result. So these bars show that the North American adults could spot the deviation in the simple case, but not in the complex. So they, they did well in the, with the musical material that's from their own culture, but not with the music material from a different culture. Look at this. Six-month-old babies are spotting the irregularity in both types of meter. And this is because they are sufficiently young that they haven't got these metrical categories. So for them, they are more open-eared, if you like, than the adults. So the adults have been enculturated. They've literally had um, what we refer to as perceptual narrowing, such that they retain the ability to hear differences in musical material that they're likely to come across, but they lose the ability to perceive irregularity in, in, in the non-native um, stimulus. But the infants, by contrast, um, perform well in both cases. Now, interestingly, when you test older infants who are a year old, they are now behaving just like 
the adults. So by a year, the perceptual narrowing has occurred. But interestingly, if they're listening to Balkan folk music for two weeks, they, the window opens, and again, they start to behave like the younger infants. But if you give the adults uh, Balkan folk music to listen to for two weeks, they don't change back. So that's because the extra exposure to this non-native material is working against a lifetime of perceptual narrowing. Whereas in the, um, in the older infants, the, the 12 months old, um, they have only just perceptually narrowed, so they can just open again with a little bit of extra exposure. And that's how language works as well. We're born into the world with the ability to make sense of any speech sound, but gradually, as we are exposed to the speech sounds that are going to be common in our culture, we become very specialised for hearing those, and we lose the ability to hear the difference in, in non-native speech sounds. So, as listeners, our ability to make sense of musical sound is impressive, but why do we listen? In short, it's for the pleasure that it brings. And this is an image from a paper by Blood and Zatore. Um, they were interested in knowing how the brain responds when people are having a shiver down the spine to music. Um, and it was a very clever design where they were able to uh, essentially show that the areas of the brain that are associated with other more basic pleasures um, were also activated when people were having this transformative experience to music. So they really did identify the sex, drugs, and rock and roll <laughs> network of the brain. Um, but why should music be so pleasurable to us? Um, is there anything adaptively significant about our enjoyment of music? Or, as Steven Pinker would suggest, is it all just auditory cheesecake that sort of tickles our mental faculties? I think um, a couple of arguments from the adaptive um, camp um, are appealing to me at least. One is that um, our brains are essentially pattern detectors and are hardwired to find order from chaos. Um, and if you think about the structure, the repetition, the hierarchical levels um, that are present in music, you can see how music can be thought of as a super stimulus for the brain in terms of finding pattern, order, repetition, um, and especially in terms of having those patterns violated and sort of played with. So um, that may be very well why um, music listening is so pleasurable, because it'll, it gives the brain a workout in terms of finding these patterns. And of course, anything that the, that the brain, um, that is adaptively advantageous for the brain is rewarded um, and reinforced um, by the brain's uh, pleasure chemicals, um, chiefly dopamine. Um, so music listening it has no survival advantage, but we get rewarded for doing it because it's a little bit like the behaviours that are um, good for us, which is making sense of a complex stimulus. Um, the second theory um, concerns something to do with m making music with other people. So when we sing together, we feel socially bonded. And actually, even um, there is release of the brain's natural painkiller, um, endorphins. Um, so Ro Robin Dunbar, um, who is a, a colleague of ours now, has suggested that making music with people may have been a, a mechanism whereby our early ancestors <coughs> went from living in very small groups where one-to-one -one physical grooming and contact was sufficient to maintain affiliative bonds. Um, when um, social groups um, enlarged such that it was too um, time-consuming to invest in this one-to-one -one grooming process, then you need something else to maintain a sense of social affiliation across the community. And um, making music together, chanting together, um, may, along with laughter, have been one mechanism um, which al allowed people to feel socially bonded together, even if they hadn't met each other. Um, and indeed, that's some work um, that we did with a, um, uh, a master student on the Music Mind and Brain course, Dan Weinstein, and with Jacques Launay, who's here today, um, where we took advantage of a community choir called Pop Choir, um, because we realised that pop choir rehearses in um, these little regional choirs um, consisting of about 70 or 80 people. 
But once a year, they aggregate to form a mega choir of about 200, 300 people, and they perform the same repertoire at the Royal Albert Hall. So we were quite interested to see if these social bonding effects and also the um, change in pain thresholds um, scaled up to this, even to this level of the mega choir. And, and we found that indeed um, these effects did scale up. So consistent with this idea that music making can have a role in this very large scale social bonding. So I hope by now I've, um, I've, I've convinced you that uh, studying music is, is not a frivolous thing to do. Um, and in fact that we can recognise how complex it, it is in terms of it being quite a sophisticated perceptual process and perhaps even adaptively significant. Um, my own interest in studying music in the brain, um, uh, well, as Pat alluded to, came when I was um, uh, working at the Institute of Cogn Cognitive Neuroscience um, with Professor Uta Frith. And at that time, um, Uta's interests were very much to do with um, literacy and how the brain changes as literacy is acquired. And we were thinking about how we could look at brain changes as, as literacy is acquired. And, but we quite quickly realised that we couldn't find a group of people who were functionally illiterate. Whereas we could find lots of people for whom music notation was completely meaningless. And more importantly, um, I was able to teach these people to read music and to play piano in a relatively small space of time. May I ask for a glass of water if anybody could grab one? Thank you. Um, so, so in that sense, I, was, um, I first got into studying music in the brain, um, using it as a tool to understand a, a wider phenomenon, which is the acquisition of a sim symbolic notation. Um, so, as you can see, that if somebody who's not at all musically literate, this would really be an impenetrable confusion of dots and dashes. Um, Whereas people who, are, who have very low li levels of literacy, when they see the written word because it's all around, they have some idea of how to decode it. Not so with music notation, so people are a true tabula rasa. And here are the willing participants in my study. So um, over three months I taught these people to read music and play piano. They had no musical um, knowledge whatsoever. It was great fun actually, and I was, uh, although the pressure was really on because I was relying on my own teaching and their own practice to change their brains and I'd already booked the scans um, <laughs> three months later so I was making a lot of phone calls asking people why they hadn't turned up or checking that they'd practiced enough and um, saying things like you're wasting my time, you're wasting your time <laughs> um, but eventually um, they all managed, thank you very much they all managed to, uh, to hit the grade and achieve their grade one standard. And we also developed a cognitive test um, to, to have a look at the interfering effect of musical notation to, to, really, um, uh, to really make clear that, that music notation had taken on a significance for them. Just to show you quickly what we did um, in the scanner. So they were lying in the scanner with a little MRI um, compatible keyboard on their lap. Um, and they had to decode um, the notation. Um, we were interested in the experimental condition, so they actually had to play a sort of five note phrase, um, both pre training and post training. Um, and we needed a control you do in functional neuroimaging design, so that was sort of a very easy version of what they were doing up here. Now, as you can see, pre training, we had to give them numbers to help them out because they really couldn't read music. Post-training, we substituted those with nonsense symbols just so there's a visual match. But we really are interested in, once you subtract out the brain's activity here versus here, what difference do you find after training that's not present before? And the answers were that the brain changed in highly precise and specific ways. And it changed differently um, according to whether they were decoding music notation for the pitch aspect, so what to play, versus when to play, the rhythm. Okay, so in the, in the pitch aspect, we see changes in superior parietal cortex. This is very congruent with the idea that, that when you're reading music um, for pitch, you're really doing a visuospatial translation. So for pianists, at least, you kind of map from the vertical onto the horizontal. That was quite different to what we saw when we just looked at the rhythm, um, apart from the um, controlling for pitch, they're so not looking at pitch. And then we see um, activation changes after training. 
in the fusiform gyrus, and this is a, a visual area important for object recognition. That again makes some sense because um, when, when you're processing notation for rhythm, there is no, it's not a spatial translation. You have to really remember when you've got a dot after it, it means this. When you've got a tail, it means this. So it's a very arbitrary mapping between the visual information and the um, action information that it represents. Perhaps my favorite uh, condition that we ran were, had nothing to do, it wasn't um, a musical task, but we used music notation and got people to do a visual search task. So they saw bars of music notation flashed up one per second, so quite fast, and they were on the lookout always for a single vertical stem going below the, the, uh, the musical stage. So it either went below or sometimes it went above, and they just had to press index finger, middle finger, just to say whether it went below or above. And here you can see that we have a sort of a control task that's visually similar, but musically meaningless. And again, we do both the experimental, sorry, mislabeled here, experimental and control. We do both of these before training and after three months of training. And what we saw was that the brain did not distinguish between these two different forms of notation pre-training. But after training, we found um, specific activation in a motor planning region of the brain, suggesting that the mere sight of the, of the musical notation, but not this weird uh, fake notation, set in motion a chain of events whereby they were preparing um, the musically relevant action, even though they weren't going to make those actions. So I'm just presenting you this, even though now it is very, very old work, um, because it got me into investigating the cognitive neuroscience of music, particularly as a tool to understand wider phenomena about the brain. And that is the kind of the track that I have stayed in, not really looking at music um, to understand music per se, but very often as a lens onto wider brain function. So the next part of the journey um, was with Professor Tim Griffiths um, at Newcastle University. And he got me into thinking um, and investigating music as a complex auditory experience, whereas previously I was really much interested in the visio-motor association rather than the auditory experience. But together we wanted to understand a disorder called congenital amusia. This is a kind of literal tone deafness, where in some cases um, people with congenital amusia cannot tell two tunes apart and cannot recognize tunes that would be familiar to others from their culture. Um, so it, uh, the, this disorder was pioneered really by um, Isabel Peretz in Montreal, and she, um, she particularly came up with the Montreal Battery for the evaluation of amusia, which is a kind of battery of tests that you can really use to diagnose this disorder. Incidentally, congenital amusia is not the same as what most people mean when they say, I'm tone deaf. So when people say that to you, mostly they mean, I think I can't sing in tune. And sometimes they can't sing in tune, or sometimes they're just being modest. Um, but if they can't sing in tune, sometimes it's because at a very early age in, in, in life, someone has said to them, oh, you're a bit out of tune. Could you just sit at the back and mine? In <laughs> I don't think that happens anymore. But for people who are sort of 50 and 60, that's a really common story. And what we have to remember is that the voice is a very complex musical instrument. And there's individual variation uh, in terms of when children hit different milestones in terms of singing. So being told that you're a little bit off key at an early age is really going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy that yes, you will be unable to sing in tune because you stop using your voice. Anyway, there were, some work had been done on congenital amusia, um, particularly by Isabel Peretz, but there was much still to understand. Um, Tim and I were interested to use music again as a tool to understand um, musical perception and auditory processing in general. A big boost for the research um, came because I was able to write an article for the BBC News um, website. Um, so I, I wrote a little piece about congenital amnesia, and critically, I had a link um, to an online version of the Montreal Battery. And um, things went a bit crazy, and on the first 
month, we had 150,000 data sets. Mostly people who were, I think, office workers wanting to outdo their colleagues um, and try to get a better score on this test. Um, what you see here is a distribution of scores, and it's out of 30, so most people do extremely well, 27 or 28. But because of the large numbers of people who took the test, we've got a nice tail end here, and we, we knew that a cutoff around 21 or below was indicative of some problem. Uh, of course, you know, very uncontrolled conditions, people doing this in an office, um, so we asked them to retake the test to confirm that they indeed would score low again, and then if they were within our sort of catchment area, we invited them into the lab and we checked that they didn't have any hearing loss or any general um, learning difficulties or any strange story whereby they've been locked in a cupboard and not able to listen to any music their whole life. Um, <laughs> And that, was a, that really um, helped me to secure my first research grant from the ESRC. In fact, it was called a first grant. Um, and I, was, I held that at Goldsmiths where I, where I had just moved. So things sort of started, started, to, uh, started to expand, really. Um, and I was able to build up a small research group. Um, Diana Omigi, Vicky Williamson, and Fang Liu were all employed on that grant. One of the really interesting things to come out of those, the early days of the Onusia work was finding a very interesting family in rural Northern Ireland. This is the O'Neill family, and I noticed in the online database 22 people had taken the test, and half of them scored in the A music range, half of them scored completely normally. So I got in touch with the person who I could see was the hub, inviting everybody in. And she said, oh, I've been expecting to hear from you. <laughs> um, she said, I thought you'd be quite interested in my family, particularly as we have a, a family business selling traditional Irish musical instruments. <laughs> so you really couldn't make it up. This was a family. Half of them were tone deaf, yet they were, you know, they were the go-to people if you needed an accordion or a fiddle or... Um, so actually, we, we went to meet them. Um, in fact, I made several visits to, um, to, to Northern Ireland, and I met all 33 of the family, so they haven't all taken the test. Um, these are two from the kind of second generation, but there are three generations, these are all the grandchildren. And um, we were able to plot a family tree. Um, so these are the parents who were standing outside the shop, both affected with the disorder. Half of the next generation are affected, in the grandchildren, we don't really know. We know if they score normally that they're not A-music, but if they score in the A-music range, um, the test is not really sensitive um, to, for children, really, because it requires attention and memory. So, um, but in any case, what this shows us, um, it really underlines the very likely biological nature of this disorder, because all the family members had had the same exposure, they'd had years of accordion lessons, of Irish dancing lessons, it was, you know, they were part, they were from a part of the country where um, music was really just everywhere. Um, so in those cir circumstances, a family like this is ideal because it shows that there's nothing odd going on in terms of um, an environmental uh, uh, interpretation of why they have this, this disorder. And in fact, we did some genetics with the family um, which unfortunately didn't, um, didn't come to anything easily interpretable and, and we think that that's very likely because it is probably a disorder of small, of many genes, all of having small effect size rather than any single gene. So these days maybe we would have been able to pick up some difference, but back in those days we, we weren't. Anyway, they were a very interesting family to, um, to document and they became the focus of um, one of those Imagine programs um, presented by Olive Sachs, in fact. So um, Alan Yentel went and, and filmed with them, and I was able to be part of that. <clears throat> so, back in London now, with um, a roughly a group of 40 A-musics, who we'd verified have this, the disorder, and 40 controls matched on age and other important uh, demographic variables. We wanted to dig a bit deeper and try to understand what's going on in this disorder. And one of the most obvious places to start was to look at pitch sensitivity. Um, what you can see here is um, hmm, some graphs. Um, we looked at pitch change detection. So how big does a pitch difference have to be in order for people to detect the change? So 
they might hear a trial that sounds like hoo, hoo, hoo. and the, the task is what's the odd one out is it the first or the last it's never the middle and if they get that one right then on the next trial the pitch change is slightly smaller and we go on doing this until we work out their threshold the level at which they can just about detect um, we had another test where it's not about detecting pitch change but discriminating the direction so here it would sound like hoo, hoo, hoo. And, if, and that one's the other one out, obviously. Um, but the next one would be more like... You can tell I've practiced this. <laughs> um, and again, we find the threshold for discriminating pitch direction. And what you see here is that's just that's an, an out, a single outlier. But on pitch change detection, um, the A musics are actually very good and very sensitive, and their thresholds are a small fraction of a semitone. So that's nothing that could explain the very severe music listening deficits that, that the Montreal Battery diagnostic test was, was highlighting. But this is a bit more interesting, pitch direction. You can see in roughly a third of the group with amusia, thresholds are above the level of a semitone, and in some cases two and a half semitones. Whereas for controls, again, this is a single outlier. For controls, they find it just as easy whether they're detecting or discriminating a pitch change. But for some amusics, this is a real problem for them. Of course, with, as with all developmental disorders, there isn't a one-size-fits-all explanation. Um, but we did find this pitch direction um, finding to be quite interesting, and, and the reason for that is because it is a building block of musical contour, which is one of the most salient properties of a musical piece. So contour refers to the pattern of ups and downs, and it's really what makes a tune distinctive and what distinguishes one tune from another. So if they have problems with this pitch direction, then perhaps it's the case that they can't build up a representation of a contour of a whole musical piece, for instance. But as I say, it didn't explain everything, because what about these people here who are completely fine? Um, what else might be going on? Another interesting character crops up. This is a nun. Um, from a convent in Wimbledon, and this is Sister Ruth, and she wrote and told me that five times a day in her convent she had to be involved in plain chant, this call and response. And sometimes not only did she have to respond when she heard the calls, but sometimes she had to lead the call and response. I think they made no concessions to the fact that she obviously really found this completely hideous and couldn't do it, but the nuns still made her do it, the other nuns made her do it anyway. And she said, when the music finished, the sound was always gone as though it had never happened, which bewildered me with a sense of failure to hold on to what I just heard. Others told me if I tried to remember, I would. I never did. I have no idea what people mean when they say, I have a tune going around in my head. I have never had a tune tell out its music in my head, let alone repeat itself. So actually, because of this um, communication from Sister Ruth, we designed an experiment. And um, that was an experiment to um, really measure empirically how much pitch-based information um, people like Sister Ruth could hold on to in their short-term memory. So we presented people with short sequences or so either the two sequences are exactly the same or if not the second and third items in the sequence are reversed in their order and if you get this trial correct uh, the next one ha would have five items per sequence, and then the next would have six. And, and in so doing, we can again find a threshold um, of the number of items that people can hold in their memory. And what you see here is that, on average, people with their music can hold on to two... Uh, the controls can encode two more items in memory, two more tones, compared with the the people with amnesia. Again, you'll notice that there's overlap, as there often is with these developmental um, disorders. But it is interesting that we do find this significant difference. And when we ran a control task where instead of tones, um, they heard spoken digits like one, three, five, four, and one, three, five, or whatever, in the order. Um, and again, we, we measure the thresholds in the same way. Um, there was no difference between the groups, suggesting it's not a general auditory short-term difficulty. Um, and instead, it seems like a, um, um, a memory uh, deficit that is selected for pitch-based material, but not auditory information in general. Um, okay, so now we can ask, 
Well, does having this disorder, we know it's got some profound impact on how you perceive music, but what about the, the music of speech? So, um, linguists differentiate, uh, so, so the music of speech is called prosody, and linguists differentiate between um, the kind of prosody uh, that is so-called linguistic, so that denotes whether something is a statement or a question, um, or provides emphasis, versus emotional prosody, which is more about the tone of the voice and the emotional uh, characteristics of the voice. Um, so we did an experiment, this was with Fang Lu, and we looked at how people with amnesia do on, when they have to uh, do the same different task. She grew up in Ely. She grew up in Ely. Okay, so are they the same or different? And you'd only be able to do that if you can really encode the, the, the intonation of those two phrases and they were different. Um, but uh, in a control condition, we stripped those phrases of all the linguistic content. Okay. And what we find is that in both conditions, whether the um, intonation is uh, present with, uh, with the linguistic material or divorced from it, we can see that people with amnesia are doing more poorly um, than, than the controls. And that's in contrast, actually, to something that Isabel Peretz had published, where they had claimed that the deficit was actually unique to the, to the musical domain. Um, but actually, with, with stimuli like the ones that we produced, where the changes were quite subtle and always occurred at the end, so you couldn't use a different strategy for the uh, music-based versus, uh, as in for the speech-based versus the non-speech-based ones, we find actually that um, that this disorder does have consequences for processing the music of, of speech. Um, now, why don't people with amnesia report any problems in everyday life with speech? I think the clue, I think, I think the um, the message there has to be that first of all, uh, the pitch changes in speech are are much greater than in music. So, a semitone is a very common interval. In, in Western music, but listening to my voice, I'm often leaping around five or six sem semitones. Um, so the pitch changes are greater, and as, you, as I showed you before, it's not the case that people with amnesia um, are completely lacking any sensitivity to pitch change, but there's something around, about direction where they need those pitch changes to be bigger, but probably in speech they are big enough. But the other thing about speech is that pitch is rarely the sort of the rate limiting step. So there's often extra information, redundant information that allows you to make sense of what's going on. Whereas in music, pitch is such an important part of the whole construct that um, the difficulties are much more apparent in the musical domain. But they're present um, in speech, it's just that the characteristics of the speech domain allow them to go slightly less noticed. And so next we looked, uh, sticking with prosody, but now considering emotional prosody, we asked whether individuals with amnesia can detect emotional tone of voice. Um, let me... The broom is in the closet and the book is on the desk. The broom is in the closet and the book is on the desk. <laughs> the broom is in the closet and the book is on the desk. Okay, so this is a collaboration with Bill Thompson um, at, uh, at the University of Macquarie. So that's where the Australian um, speakers and what you can see here is that individuals were overall impaired and significantly so for happiness, sadness, tenderness and emotion. And their performance correlated with their pitch direction thresholds, telling us that there probably is something very important about that pitch direction deficit that I showed you earlier. Um, so this was some evidence that music and speech do seem to be associated with shared resources for, the de for decoding acoustic signals of emotion. Um, and these difficulties aren't even limited to prosody that's super, superimposed onto language. So, <coughs> so these are non-verbal vocalizations, and um, our individuals with amnesia also performed more poorly on tasks requiring them to identify and discriminate non-verbal vocalizations. But the surprise to us was that we even saw a deficit when they were required to process silent, um, dynamic facial videos. So these are videos of people expressing emotion purely facially, um, that they are actually little videos 
Um, and this was in order such that you know the, the, the nonverbal vocalizations proceed over time, so we wanted something <laughs> visual that also had a dynamic element. And what you see here is that the AMUSICs do poorly on this as well. So that was a real surprise, um, and we suggest actually that perhaps it reflects a cascade effect whereby if you have faulty decoding of emotion from voice from early on in life, then this might have knock-on effects for your social and emotional processing in other domains. We're not claiming that people with amnesia have, you know, extremely noticeable social and emotional processing difficulties, but nevertheless there is some subtle, um, some, something subtle going on that we've managed to identify. Okay, something interesting um, uh, I wanted to know was how do these musical perceptual difficulties um, impact upon appreciation and uses of music in everyday life? On the one hand, you might think, if you can't perceive music normally, how could you ever really derive satisfaction or pleasure from it? But on the other hand, we know from um, sociological studies and psychological studies and ethnography that um, there is the extrinsic aspects of music are very important to people too. So it's not just about the musical notes. And very often, um, it's about the message that the music is conveying um, and its uh, genre and how that meshes with your own personal identity. So particularly younger people use music to form their, their kind of sense of self and to be with other people enjoying that same type of music. So there's a lot of extrinsic factors um, on which people might say, I like this music, um, at, but it's not actually necessarily to do with the music itself. So it could have gone either way, really. Just to say that um, actually uh, Nabokov may have been a music. Um, so he said, music, I regret to say, affects me merely as an arbitrary succession of more or less irritating sounds. Under certain emotional circumstances, I can stand the spasms of a rich violin, but the concert piano and all the instruments bore me in small doses and flay me in larger ones. And one of our participants said, I used to go to concerts. It was the thing to do. I didn't enjoy it. My husband asked me what music I liked. I said, loud music. I married him, and he played Mozart. I said, turn off that awful noise. We went to operas, and I slept through several of them. He really nagged me. We got divorced. <laughs> and so we wanted to look at this. Um, in a bit more detail, maybe these are just the interesting anecdotes and they're not representative. So with Claire MacDonald, an early master's student um, on the clinical um, uh, master's programme here, um, we did a, a questionnaire study asking people with their museum how likely they were to use music in these everyday situations, the psychological functions that they ascribe to music listening, and how they would feel about music in these very common public places. And what you can see here is that, again, of course, there's overlap, but um, the, for people with amnesia, there seems to be a subgroup who are really um, reporting using music just as, for as many reasons and for the same psychological functions as the controls. Um, and we followed this up um, with some very nice work from um, my, my uh, PhD student, Diana Omigi, who's also here, um, and we used something called experience sampling methodology where we contacted the um, A musics in the stream of everyday life for a whole week. So they received a few text uh, messages from us every day. And the question was, is there music where, where you are? If no, then it's not interesting. They don't have to do anything else. But if there is music, we asked them a number of questions about, did you choose to listen to it? Um, who are you with? Uh, why are you listening to it? Uh, what's it done to your mood? How much attention are you paying this music? Um, several questions like this to really get a multifaceted view on whether or not people with amusia are using music and appreciating it differently to people without amusia. And Diana did some sophisticated cluster analysis where essentially we, we, we took the profiles of each of the participants and we clustered them and we found that they fell into two discrete clusters, um, either side of this blue line. And when we looked at who was in each cluster and whether they were a musical control, what you can see here is that almost all of the controls were in cluster two, um, whereas the people with amnesia were split. 40% of the amnesics were in with this mostly group of controls, but 60 of them were in this other cluster. And these two different clusters 
differed on the frequency of, like, of listening, the choice over listening, and the attention and liking that they gave to the music. So really corroborating the first more simple study of Claire MacDonald, we see enormous variation, but we see a big chunk of the own musics who are indistinguishable from the controls in terms of what, how much they're choosing to listen and why they're listening and the attention that they pay to music. So that's very interesting because I suppose it supports the view that um, you know, music is evaluated on much more than the musical notes. Um, and having perceptual difficulties with music is no bar to appreciating it and deriving satisfaction from it. Um, okay, so I've argued that there's a pitch direction um, difficulty um, which probably leads to difficulties representing the overall shape of a piece of music, that there are implications outside of the musical domain, especially when pitch contrasts are subtle, that appreciation versus perception can dissociate, and that there seems to be a genetic basis for the disorder, um, although we have not managed to map the genes um, as yet. Okay, so, so much for amusia. Uh, I want to move away from having too little music in the head, like Sister Ruth, to having um, a great deal of music in the head. And now I'm coming on to talk a little bit about earworms. So... Earworms, um, you probably know, are snippets of a tune that arise spontaneously in your mind and normally repeat. Um, they just pop into, the, pop into your head. Uh, very often people don't know why. Um, there's a common view that actually that they're really uh, bothersome in most cases, but we've done some research that suggests no, m most people either feel neutral or even quite positive about their earworms. Um, you might think it's slightly trivial or, or kind of curious to, um, to, to study earworms, but actually I would again say that, our, that they're a really interesting model for understanding spontaneous thought processes in general. So for instance, mind wandering is something that we know people are engaging in you know, 40, 50% of their waking hours. And it's very difficult to understand um, mind wandering processes because they're very idiosyncratic. And it's difficult to establish, you know, to really probe the content of people's wandering thoughts. Um, contrast that with music in the head. Very often it's to familiar tunes where we can ask people about what they've got in their head. And we can even measure dimensions of that music. I'll talk in a little while about the measuring tempo. Um, but there's different aspects that we can really probe to try to understand something about the content of people's spontaneous imagery um, and what that might say about our spontaneous thought process in, processes in general. Um, it was serendipity really uh, that I started doing this work and I was listening to the Sean Keaton Breakfast Show on Six Music. They have a feature called Earworms. It must have been running for 10 years now. I think they, they don't really change up very often. <laughs> um, and people were writing into the show or texting in saying, I've woken up with this tune in my head. Um, and one of the songs was chosen to be played on air. So I wasn't doing anything at all on earworms, but I had a chat with a colleague who said, every time I do a public engagement event, someone says, why do we have music in our heads? And I really can't answer it. So I was listening to this breakfast show, I thought, hmm, I wonder if I can start doing some work. Got in touch with the show, that they were really interested, and they shared the anonymized data that people had been contributing, which included re people's reasons for, or at least why they thought they may have certain tunes in their head. Um, so we set up a sort of more formalised kind of <coughs> data collection um, situation. And we analysed the qualitative data. So this is text data that people submitted. And we tried to identify the triggers for, for music in their head. And they basically boiled down to exposure to music, not a very surprising one, but then memory processes, um, mood states, and um, low attention states such as dreaming and mind wandering. So to give you some examples, exposure, um, someone said, Duck Tales by Donald Duck and his nephews. It's driving me mad. My three-year-old has got the DVD on repeat. I know it's not a proper song, but it's a proper earworm. That's an example of repeated exposure. Memory, my earworm today is This Charming Man by The Smiths, because every time I see David Cameron, that song appears in my head for some particular reason. So that's an example of association. Um, an example of affective states, this is a goodie, 
My earworm is Nathan Jones by Banana Rama. I first caught it in 1989 during GCC chemistry, and I've been plagued by it in moments of extreme stress since <laughs> wedding, childbirth, etc. Um, and finally, low attention states. My earworm's Mulder and Scully by Catatonia. I dreamt about running through the woods, and this was the soundtrack in my head. So this qualitative study shows us that exposure to music is just one trigger for the music in our heads, but in addition, triggers come from spreading activation in autobiographical and semantic memory, so this is the association thing. And then we find this interesting interaction with mood and arousal. So you might think, okay, what we have music in their heads, so what? Is that just like an by uninteresting byproduct of the brain at rest? Or possibly, could, could it serve some useful function? So a couple of examples that I came across made me actually think that perhaps earworms could be useful. And who knows who this person is? This is Oliver Sacks. And um, in his book called A Leg to Stand On, he talks about how he was climbing a Norwegian fjord. And uh, he saw this sign that said, beware of the bull, which he found amusing until it stampeded him. And he <laughs> fell and broke his leg. And he was on his own on the side of a mountain, and the light was fading. Uh, being Oliver Sacks, he splinted his own leg with his umbrella, and was sort of doing his best to get, get down the mountain. But he really was in a bad way and very far away from civilization. Um, so anyway, he said, how night? How nice it is here, I thought to myself. Why not a little rest, a nap maybe? The suggestion was lethal and filled, with, filled me with horror, but I was lulled by its soft, seductive tones. No, I said fiercely, this is death speaking, and in its sweetest, steadiest siren voice, don't listen to it. Don't listen ever. You've got to go on whether you like it or not. You can't rest here. And then there came to my aid uh, melody, rhythm, and music. Before crossing the stream, I had muscled myself down, moving my main force along. Uh, with my very strong arms. Now, so to speak, I was music to long. I did not contrive this. It happened to me. I fell into a rhythm guided by a sort of marching or rowing song, sometimes the vulgar boatman's song, sometimes a monotonous chant, accompanied by these words, Ona has the Ona Rath. Um, never had Goethe's words been put to better use. So, as another final example um, in Touching the Void, um, which uh, tells the story of two climbers, Joe Simpson and Simon Yates, attempting to climb the Peruvian Andes, and they, um, they have a near-fatal fall. Um, Joe, Joe Simpson falls into a, a crevice and has a broken leg, and he's stuck um, in the middle of a raging storm. And he says, I had a song going through my head, it was Bo Boney M. I don't really like Boney M's music. It went on and on for hours. I found it upsetting because I wanted to think of other things, like his loved ones that he was about to lose, probably. I found myself thinking, bloody hell, I'm going to die to the music of Boney M. <laughs> So these examples are quite interesting because um, they are, they're not liked and they're completely involuntary. And it got me thinking about something that I have referred to as mental homeostasis. The idea being that perhaps um, our brains require some optimum level of stimulation in order to be primed and ready to successfully navigate in our environment. Um, but when you know, consciousness slips too low, um, perhaps this inner music is the brain's way of generating that extra bit of mental stimulation. So um, I, I think I've also said that it might be like a sonic screensaver um, for the brain. came up with that when I was interviewed by Canadian TV. I don't know where it came from, <laughs> but it stuck with me. Um, so from less extreme examples of near-death experience and earworms, to some work that we've actually done to examine a potential link between earworms and mental arousal. And as I said before, earworms have useful measurable features, and the one we made most use of was tempo. So let's do an experiment, first of all, to think about tempo. I want you to listen to these three <coughs> snippets and tell me which one is at the correct speed. <laughs> Who 
Who thinks C? Right, like 99% actually. Okay, so this is to illustrate, and you're correct, this is to illustrate that we have a form of what we call absolute tempo. So we encode music at a very, very precisely in terms of its, its speed, you know, even if we haven't heard it very many times. Um, and actually, um, this, we did a study to look at how this feeling that, about the correct speed um, interacts with physiological arousal. And we did that by asking people to do a couple of minutes of exercise and then do something like you've just done now. And interestingly, people found faster tunes to sound, the faster version to, to seem correct. And when I was actually popping these tunes in just before the talk, I had exactly the same experience that I was convinced that the middle one was the correct one, which tells you something about my state of physiological arousal <laughs> at that time. So that's in terms of a relationship between tempo and uh, physiological arousal, but we had never looked at that with respect to earworms. So with Kelly Yakubowski, we conducted a study that we called Tracking the Speed of Our Mental Soundtracks. We got people to wear um, an accelerometer on their wrist. This is just like a watch, but you can tap and it registers your movement. So it was a way for us to, to really objectively collect people's earworms as they occurred, but more than that, to measure something about the beat that they were experiencing in these earworms. Tap out your earworm as it occurs, jot down the details, what it is you're, you're getting, what were you doing at the time, and tell us a bit about your mood and arousal using some standardised ratings. Um, we were interested, can we capture the tempo of earworms in the stream of everyday life? And um, if so, how veridically are these earworms experienced in terms of tempo? That means how faithful are people's recalled songs to the original recorded version? Um, and is there a relationship between the tempo or the upbeatness or downbeatness of the song that they are getting and their current state of mood and arousal. We had 17 participants that did this over four days. We collected 275 episodes, 182 unique songs, a mix of everything you could really imagine, um, with a, a very wide range of temp tempi. Um, importantly, 132 of those were related to canonical versions. That means that there's a single definitive version of the song people were experiencing, as opposed to something like a nursery rhyme where there's no single tempo. So we were able to go to the original songs and find out what is the definitive objective tempo of these songs and then measure how people experienced it in the stream of everyday life. Um, interestingly, only one song out of uh, the 182 songs reported were reported by more than one person. Uh, would you like to hear it? <laughs> you would. You'll regret it. Party, let's go party! <laughs> Well, very strikingly, we found extreme precision um, of the tempo um, of these earworms. So even though we were collecting these in the stream of everyday life, when we compared the tempo that people were tapping their earworms um, and the original recorded versions, we get an extremely high correlation. So it's less than 10% deviation from the original recorded tempo. So that was very interesting to us. Uh, it was already it was known that if you ask people to deliberately recall s songs from long-term memory, they have this absolute tempo uh, characteristic. But for tunes that are spontaneously popping into the head, where we're uh, collecting in the stream of everyday life, that was still striking to us. But also very interesting was that we found this relationship with um, self-reported physiological arousal, so um, and the tempo of the reported earworm. So that means that the degree to which your specific earworm was either an up-tempo or a down-tempo song was determined by your current state of physiological arousal. So not like having a mid-tempo song that you heard in a sped-up version or a slowed-down version, but actually you would only be given, if you like, or you would only spontaneously recall a song that was in the the correct range for your current state of physi physiological arousal because of this um, 
finding that we are very veridical in our representation. I hope that's sort of clear. So just to wrap up with this earworm bit, we've identified some common triggers um, for earworms in the wild and also in the lab. There's so much that I haven't got time to tell you about that's in square brackets. And we developed this uh, valid and reliable tool to capture multiple aspects of the earworm experience. Here I've just talked to you about capturing the tempo of this inner phenomenon. We also looked at the role of cognitive load in the lab, and we looked at the structural features of uh, earworms, sorry, we sometimes call it in me if we're being a bit more formal. And we also um, published some work looking at uh, how brain structure predicts different individual differences in the earworm experience. Um, okay, I'm soon wrapping up now. Um, I just wanted to say that um, the last couple of years I've um, started to think about how basic knowledge around music and the brain um, can find application in clinical fields, and particularly the link between music and movement. Um, we know a lot from high-level musicians about music performance, but in fact a lot that we know about the connection between the auditory and the motor system is even applicable to something like designing protocols for movement rehabilitation after stroke. Um, and I, I'm involved in a very exciting collaboration that my PhD student Pedro Kirk is, um, is leading on, and it's a collaboration with our colleagues at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, specifically the upper limb service there under the um, directorship of Nick Ward and his team. You might have seen a program on Horizon last night, a, a journey of a stroke survivors' recovery, and some of that featured the work of the upper limb service, who are now our close colleagues. And they are really giving us carte blanche to think about how music can be used to provide enriched environments for rehabilitation after stroke. And just a couple of videos to leave you with of what we're doing just in the initial exploratory stages. Um, this is Pedro's work. So he has designed some prototypes of digital musical interfaces um, based on what stroke survivors told us they would find useful in terms of music and rehab. Actually, um, Pedro won a, a, a prize, uh, an international prize at uh, Computer Human Interaction uh, meeting in Korea a couple of years ago for the best student presentation, which was which was really nice. So he's been developing these prototypes, some of which we'll be taking forward, um, some of which we won't. Um, one of w one that we've been working uh, around now is focusing on a single movement, um, which is uh, forward reach. And this is really just making use of the fact that people like to move to the beat of their favourite music. Um, and this shows Pedro working with a stroke survivor um, over several sessions, and you can sort of see the improvement. feeling fatigued because he was enjoying it because he was moving to the beat of something he really liked and it's the repetition of these movements that's the key to functional recovery recovery i should say this is a um, example of a, um, a very nice collaboration with uh, mick grierson as the co-supervisor um, so an another example of computing and psychology here at goldsmiths working nicely together and 
So um, we're in the process of thinking very hard about how to leverage what we know about music and movement to create the most creative and motivating framework in all sorts of different ways um, for physical rehabilitation. So I hope um, some of what I have shown today has given some insight into how I've spent my last 12 years at Goldsmiths. Um, it's been a real privilege to, to have this position here um, and to pursue fascinating work, I think so anyway, with um, highly talented and very motivated students and colleagues in a very collegial and supportive environment. And lastly, I want to acknowledge um, the incredible support that I've had through my career, but particularly the last few years uh, where I've needed it um, greatly um, on the home front. And here's my husband, Simon, fine-tuning our son Rowan's musical hemispheres. So thank you for this honour and thank you for listening. Describe Lauren as a member of the department. I suppose um, doesn't take no as an answer, is it? The one? It's an answer. <laughs> um, I, I remember when she first arrived in the department, uh, thinking in department board's very refreshing approach. She'd sort of say things like, "This doesn't make any sense whatsoever. <laughs> Let's do it better." And then it's pretty good, and it's been very helpful. I think to have that kind of critical and motivating um, course for us. Um, on a more personal note, I found Lauren incredibly helpful for my career. Um, I was sort of floundering around sort of 2008 or so. Lauren took me to the pub and gave me a bit of talking to, told me to write a grant and, and I said, oh okay. And then at the end she said, so you're going to do that then? And I did. And I got the grant. Uh, so, so I've got um, a lot to thank um, Lauren for um, personally. And I think that story wouldn't, wouldn't be a unique one. We've got lots of colleagues who I'm sure have benefited in similar ways uh, from, from Lauren's kind of help, help and guidance. Um, in terms of uh, Lauren's kind of activity as an academic and research, I think you all agree, obviously, what wonderful talk and, um, and what wonderful kind of intellect and creativity that she has and who else would bring a sort of start in, in the forefront of neuroscience brain imaging and brain stimulation over the ICN and the goldsmiths bringing together music and psychology. Um, she follows her own um, instincts and does unpredictable things, but it's always, I think, it's always intellectual integrity which is driving that and, and um, driving real progress and wonderful creative outcomes for, for Lauren, for Goldsmiths and for our department. Um, who else would have uh, Proust mentioned in the first uh, paragraph of her departmental website? <laughs> um, but on, so on, on that note, um, I just want to, to, um, to give a vote of thanks to Lauren for a wonderful lecture, which is obviously recognition of her fantastic, wonderful contribution to our department over the last 12 years, um, recognised in her promotion to professorship. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you. to have questions um, at these inaugural lecture events, but I'm sure Lauren will be talking to people. Thank you.